Welcome to the New Thinking for a New World podcast, where we explore the most pressing issues that are challenging and changing our societies. We are looking for new thinking and new solutions wherever we can find them. Listen as host Alan Stoga, the Talberg Foundation's chairman, challenges his guests for analysis, ideas and actions. Together, we can help make our world at least a bit better. Projections show that by 2050, Africa's population is likely to double. By 2100, one in three people on Earth will be African, including almost half of the young people. As goes, Africa goes or will go the world. So how is Africa doing? In one sense, that's a nonsensical question to ask about 54 countries and almost 1.4 billion people. But even dumb questions can sometimes have smart answers. Mikel Arang has spent nearly three decades writing about Africa as a journalist and as an author. She's deeply knowledgeable about the people, the politics, and the day-to-day reality, and by any measure is a damn good writer. Welcome, Mikel. Thank you for having me. I meant that about your writing. I am a very tough critic, but I'm absolutely blown away by the quality of your storytelling. Well, uh, that to me is the ultimate compliment, because... um, I do a lot of academic reading when I'm researching my books, and I often find it very dry and very heavy going. And it it doesn't matter how fascinating the topic is, if you don't present it in an accessible way, you're scaring off your readers. So I always see that my first task, and I can do it because I'm a journalist, and that's what we're trained to do, is to, to hook the reader in. The anecdote you start one of your books with, you're in an airport, you have sort of made it almost through the the gauntlet and your suitcase breaks. And that made it to me as a reader so real. I've seen that movie. And all of a sudden (laughs) you lose complete control of everything because your suitcase is falling apart and you're struggling with that and you're struggling with your passport. So getting me into the story is critical, even if the story then is, is, is a pretty heavy read. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. Uh, yes. And airports seem to feature a lot in my books, uh, whether it's fiction or nonfiction. And I, I, I'm sure there's a reason for that. I did a lot of traveling when I was an Africa correspondent. So uh, getting through the airport was a psychological hurdle you always had to get through. <laughs> Let's start with where your bookshelf, for the moment at least, leaves off with Do Not Disturb, recently published, is a scathing assessment of Rwanda's long-term president, Paul Kagame. And I've got to say, this is the same country, Rwanda, that some consider to be the Singapore of Africa, and that 40% of companies surveyed by the World Bank just before the pandemic rated as attractive or very attractive. That's almost bipolar in a sense. Um, is this about wanting to see something that's not there, or really effective public relations, or something else? I think it's a whole host of factors. Uh, one of them is certainly uh, wanting to see something that's uh, not necessarily there or not there in quite such a, you know, a strong presentation as we would like to think. I think Rwanda's often presented as a miracle, and it's not. It's a country where aid is, is well spent, uh, but it receives an awful lot of aid, and it's a very small country, 12 million people. So you would expect a country of 12 million people that receives that level of aid to be looking good. There is an awful lot of of wishful thinking that takes place. I have a lot of sympathy with that. I've been covering Africa since the 1990s, early 1990s. And I can completely understand that people who've worked in development or diplomats or policymakers, um, people who work for NGOs, Africans themselves, first and foremost, uh, they want to see the stories come good. You know, they are frustrated. Uh, They think they should be doing better. Uh, They've had uh, one election after another in most of these countries. They've seen rigging sort of setting in as a way of life. They've seen corruption that seems to be an insoluble problem. And in countries like Rwanda, they've seen some really frightening levels of repression becoming the norm. Uh, So I think there is a a sense of, uh, well, you know, there's a tendency to gloss over the negatives in the international community, Uh, a tendency to sort of say, well, don't hold it up to the same standard as, say, Scandinavia or Denmark or Norway. You know, this is Africa. This is Central Africa. This is a country that came through a genocide. What what do you expect? You cannot you cannot uh, expect miracles in that way from it. So yeah, there, there's a desperation for success stories. But finally, you you did put uh, your finger on on another element, which is um, uh, Rwanda is very very good at PR. They uh, have their their own local journalists are firmly in check. I mean, you, you'll never read a word of 
of criticism of Paul Kagame, the president in the local media. They, they operate a fierce army of uh, Twitter trolls who, who shoot down or try to shoot down anyone who criticizes the government or the president or, or in the social media. The same on Facebook, Instagram, all the usual outlets. Uh, and then they, they um, employ at huge expense um, some very smart uh, lobby firms and PR companies in the West. And they, they really do a very, very good job. I mean, Rwanda has, has the most amazing brand control and image management. I've never seen the like in Africa. It's, it's very, very impressive. And the, the result is you see things like, you know, the Arsenal team, you know, with this Visit Rwanda shirts on their football players. And you see NBA tournaments being staged in, in Kigali and cycling championships and the first drone airport ever opened in Africa was in Kigali. These are, these are smart moves. They're sort of very media-friendly moves. So, so they know what they're doing on that front. Uh, and, it, and it does work. But, but the final factor that I'd just like to sort of highlight, uh, which we can't get away from, is that there is a legacy of guilt that is associated with, um, with Rwanda. And I think that tempers a lot of criticism. People are very aware in the international community, and so they should be, that you know, when the genocide kicked off in 1994 and the Hutu army, uh, the Hutu government's army and Hutu extremists were slaughtering members of the minority Tutsi community, um, the UN had a peacekeeping force in place. And instead of immediately reinforcing it, um, it, it was pulling out the peacekeepers and, and leaving the killing to, to, take, to, to, to wreak havoc on the country. Uh, and that's something that uh, the Rwandan government has never forgotten or forgiven. And whenever Paul Kagame is criticized in public, it's a card he throws on the table very effectively. And it, it shuts people up. And it was very interesting. You know, most of my book, I'm talking to dissidents who used to work very closely with Kagame, used to be members of his um, inner cabinet. And one of them, um, a former ambassador to the US, was saying to me, I was always amazed, but you could always play the guilt card and it always worked. It would just shut the West up. So it's knowingly used. That guilt card is played knowingly and it's very effective. You make the point, if I remember in the book um, about the guilt card, that in a sense, it's the Rwandans who should be guilty, not the foreign community. Yes, the foreign community did not respond, but it's the Rwandans uh, who did what they did. Yet there's this remarkable ability to flip it around and say, as you just said, and as you document. Well, yes, that's particularly true. Um, I, I mean, it, it was a, a Rwandan, horrific Rwandan episode in which a Rwandan uh, army and, its, um, and the extremist militias that it had happily allowed to, um, to, to sort of exist alongside it. Um, just laid into and slaughtered so many of the uh, uh, Tutsi civilians. That was a, a domestic episode. And, and one of the elements that, of course, the, the government that is in place now in Kigali doesn't want anyone to comment on or make any link to is that the atmosphere of toxic hatred between um, Hutus and Tutsis had, uh, you know, uh, it, it didn't come out of nowhere. One of the reasons why the local Hutu community uh, could so easily be nagged and bullied and threatened into taking up machetes and killing their next door neighbours was because um, Rwanda had been invaded in 1990 by the Rwandan Patriotic Front, Kagame's uh, rebel movement. And, and that was something that everyone in the country was extremely aware of. There were stories of uh, atrocities and ethnic cleansing and massacres taking place uh, in the area controlled by the RPF. And those stories were coming back to Kigali. So people in Kigali, Hutus, were really, really frightened of what the RPF's arrival in Kigali would herald. So uh, the RPF today does bear some responsibility for having helped create the climate in which genocide and, uh, you know, the Hutu hate radio could tell people, go and kill your neighbor. Uh, and that, that would seem a, a response that, you know, that had some sort of logic to it. Um, that didn't come out of nowhere. Let's look at for a second at the half full glass. Fact is, in 2021, Rwanda does have better infrastructure, better health outcomes, stronger growth than most other sub-Saharan African countries. The economics, the social side of it, so on, uh, are pretty successful. 
is it a model that could or should be imitated or is this combination of the dark side and the light side such that uh, no imitating this would be a real bad idea well i think what i i find concerning about this model is is that i think a lot of um, rwanda's development uh, partners have ended up thinking that it goes hand in hand uh, with an extremely repressive and undemocratic system uh, so we know, for example, that, um, you know, elections routinely return Kagame to power with 98.8% uh, of the vote, uh, which is a, a, a sort of tally that anywhere else in the world people laugh at and, and regard it as a as de facto indication that the uh, the vote was rigged. And we know from former insiders that, that, uh, that elections have been rigged in Rwanda, and I think we can take it as read that they routinely are. So, um, so that's one issue. Alongside all the positives that you've mentioned, you've also got um, a press that is completely supine. Journalists, the journalists who were independent and stood up to the government or criticised um, people in power uh, ended up being chased into exile or were actually killed. Uh, you have no real opposition. They're, they're nominally opposition parties, but they can't really do the job that an opposition would be expected to do. Um, all, all the real opposition figures are abroad. And one of the phenomenons that I track in my book is the deliberate systematic program to um, track down all these dissidents who have fled the country and who have set up opposition parties in places like um, the US, South Africa, Belgium, Paris, Canada, even Australia, um, and to track them down and, and try and get them either silenced, uh, roughed up or get them killed. But um, what I find really worrying is that there is so much admiration for what uh, Rwanda has achieved on the development front that there seems to have become a, a, a sort of assumption that you have to be a disciplinarian, you have to be an authoritarian ruler to deliver those achievements. And, of course, uh, that linkage isn't there and can never be there. And uh, the notion that seems to have sort of taken root amongst many development people that um, democracy messy... Um, that there's too much squabbling, democracy is corrupt, and it's just much easier to work with people like Kagame. Kagame, you often hear said about Kagame, he is a man, a leader who gets things done. I think that becomes very dodgy territory because you're wishing on African citizens a, a regime and a style of life and a level of repression that you would never accept if, uh, in your own country. So why should we, uh, as development partners, be supporting it and funding it uh, in an African uh, in an African state. Well, you, you put that as a rhetorical question, but it is exactly the right question. Uh, even Freedom House counts only five freely functioning democracies out of fifty five countries in Africa. Um, you're very hard pressed to find an example of a of a year in year out successful democracy. Um, quite the opposite. It, Kagame's not the only one who tends to succeed himself with, with great, great enthusiasm, for, at, at least as, as they count the votes. Is democracy possible in Africa? How do, we, how do we reframe this story? Because I agree 100% that we apply very low standards. We say, oh, it's Africa, of course. Um, and hence, you're willing to accept the repression in, in a country like Rwanda. Uh, because you see a trade-off and say, well, that's a fair trade-off, which you would not accept in Latin America, you'd not accept in Asia, but you accept in Africa. The longer I spend working um, on Africa and traveling around in Africa, the the more it is borne upon me that um, the nation state is a fragile and recent arrival in Africa um, and that um, ethnic identity um, holds the key to everything. Um, and um, that, you know, our problem as Western countries is we often confront Africa assuming that the countries we're dealing with and the governments we're dealing with have been around as long as, as our own uh, <laughs> countries and governments have been. And instead, you know, I'm, I'm just so aware that it boils down to ethnic identity. So, for example, if you look at what's happening in Ethiopia, the six percent of the population in Ethiopia that is Tigrayan is now feeling that it's being ethnically cleansed by an army dominated by Oromo and Amhara interests, um, commanded by Ethiopia's Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. Uh, 
if you look at Kenya as well, the sort of continuing sniping that you see between communities such as the Kikuyu and the Luo and the Kalenjin um, and the discussion that continues to take place around those. Nowhere is this more toxic than in Rwanda where there's this old kind of rivalry uh, between the Tutsis who used to be the cattle keeping overlords and the Hutus who were the sort of land tilling serfs uh, who served under them um, has become so utterly poisonous. And I think you you know, you, you have to have a democratic system that, that caters for those um, ethnic awarenesses and identities and, and allows them to express themselves and, and not foist upon these um, countries uh, a sort of straitjacket that has suited us okay in, here in the West but doesn't work. And I think one of the obvious answers to that, and, it, and it, Kenya is a very interesting example because they've been going through this, this um, uh, long experiment in, in federalism and uh, sort of decentralizing power in, in Kenya. Um, and uh, in DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, they've also attempted to introduce a more federal system um, where more money made from the region stays in the regions. The thing is that people who are heads of state and government ministers don't like federal systems because it means surrendering power and surrendering income. And they will often work to undermine and sabotage uh, those attempts at introducing more local accountability and those attempts to keep you know local resources in the areas from which those assets come but i think uh, that that has to be one of the ways in future and that has to be the the form that democracy will take and i mean the other thing that seems to have been um, have to not to work at all well in africa is the first past the post system that of course we we have here in britain because that uh, that's a winner takes all system and you need a again you need a system where um uh, smaller groups will get something some share of the pie so i think you know there are there are changes that can be made that um, and tinkerings that can be done that give democracy a much better chance of survival. And I think they are these experiments are being made, and and we need to look at those and, and study them. Um, I mean, it is very interesting what's going on in Ethiopia because, of course, the outgoing um, government of Melisanawi had introduced this concept of nationalist federalism, and their argument was that people will only stay part of the system you know, all these different regions, if they, if they can, if they have the right to break away. And, and I always thought that was a very enlightened um, approach. But then you used to talk to people in Ethiopia and they say, oh, but it's nonsense because really the ruling Tigrayans, the TPLF, really has all its key people in the regions and they're really running the show. So it's notional uh, federalism. It's not, um, it's not the real thing. And I think this is the trouble that, that often the concept is a good one but is undermined by the reality or is whittled away, deliberately undermined and sabotaged by uh, the people who hold executive control in the capital. After a year of pandemic, many people blame their leaders for what has been an incredibly difficult time during which governments and many other organizations performed poorly. But maybe there are great leaders who, despite the problem, are working to make our world a bit better. If you know someone like that, in your company, in your university, in your community, anywhere. Please nominate that person for the Talberg SNF Aliasin Global Leadership Prize. Go to talbergprize.org. That's T A L L B E R G prize.org. The outsiders, mostly the West, uh, institutions like the World Bank and like the International Monetary Fund, for that matter, the United Nations institutions are all set up around the nation state concept and they want to work through those structures because that's that's what they do i would assume there's very little incentive on the part however well-meaning everything else they're doing is on their part to say okay well let's sit back and wait for some of these federal structures to work their way out yes and you could say the infrastructure of the of the country is built so that it centralizes things you know Every local politician thinks he's going to end up going to the capital and having a house in the capital, uh, whereas you know under a federal system he should be um, focusing on um, on his villa in his own uh, regional capital and uh, spending his time and his money 
on the local area. But but you know it's so common that syndrome, isn't it? Of uh, you know uh, there's an election and then the big man goes to the big city and and builds a big villa. <laughs> there was a reason why all roads led to Rome. Um, yes. And, and that that reason continues. Well, let's shift gears slightly. And you already touched a bit on it, um, but I, I'd like to talk about journalism. And clearly, journalists, as you implied, over time, have skin in the game. They want their story to be on the front page. They want their <laughs> when we used to have front pages. Uh, they want their story to succeed. That's incredibly relevant today when advocacy journalism, which I think is an oxymoron, but others don't, is clearly on the rise all over the place. Um, and you've lived it. And then you speak to this repeatedly in Do Not Disturb and your own gradual weight awareness that you are arguing the case and, and sometimes didn't take facts that suggested something else. You've now sat back and redone the whole story, which is what Do Not Disturb is all about. But I think that question of journalists and journalism and this concept of advocacy journalism is terribly important, not just in Africa, but in Britain, in Europe, in the United States. Um, how do we get out of a world where that's viewed as a good thing, that journalists should be advocates? Isn't that dangerous? Yes, I think it, it is dangerous. I mean, I joined, um, I became a journalist for Reuters News Agency, and, and that was a really good training ground because um, their whole shtick is facts, 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 and more facts, and we're not interested in what you think as, as the writer, as the author. And if you're going to cite an opinion, you must have a source. Uh, there's, and, there's a novel concept. <laughs> yeah, I know. Can you prove it? Who said it? You know, when did they say it? Can you name them? Um, and, and of course that, yeah, that has become a very old fashioned form of journalism. It's still the journalism on which every other advocacy journalist practitioner relies because you have to know the facts before you can start, um, um, spouting any opinions. I'm very torn on this, this issue. Um, I mean, it's, it's, um, as, as, as I've become an older journalist and an older writer, I've obviously developed opinions, you know, and, and in fact, you could say that's one of the reasons why I went into writing books because um, I went from Reuters to the Financial Times, which was also quite level headed and didn't want you frothing at the mouth in, in your articles. Um, and there comes a point where you, you do want to express your political opinions or your, you know, your, your sense of humor. Or you just want to let rip a bit more. And then that's when um, books give you that opportunity. But I, I have massive doubts, just as you do. And, uh, and really do not disturb is trying to be honest about the fact that um, that I think journalists get it wrong all the time, and that the, the least you can do is say so after the event when you when you realise it. Um, I mean, the nature of truth is such a sort of challenging issue, and there are so many occasions uh, in my career where I look back and I just I think, oh my god, I got it so wrong, or why didn't I write this, or why didn't I see that? And and certainly not only to do with Rwanda. I mean, any any episode that you've been involved in as a, as a journalist you're sort of looking back and thinking hmm I really missed the point there but you know that that's the first draft of history is is always going to be a very messy messy draft um, and and the only thing you can do is is try to remind yourself that that your job is um is to um include as many viewpoints and as as many counter indicative facts um in your in your reportage but that's, a good, but that's a good journalist speaking and a journalist, I think, who doesn't see her role as advocacy. Uh, and those used to be those used to be in contradiction. The opinion page used to be the opinion page and, and the, the news page used to be the news page. And it really does seem that there's a merging, a conscious and aggressive merging of the two, even in some of the best. Traditionally, the best news outlets in the world. Or, or am I being too American in that? No, I, I think um, I think all journalists now are expected to be advocates, yeah, um, and and I think uh, I think one of one of the the lessons of my book is how dangerous that is because um, uh, it allows you to 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 miss the most obvious facts and to misinterpret things, and then 
you know, looking back years later, you sort of think, um, you know, why, why didn't I, why didn't I focus more on that? What was I thinking of? And no one enjoys that experience of thinking, oh, I really messed it up. Um, I mean, I recount the, the, the episode in, in the book where uh, I went to interview Seth Sendashonga, who was the Rwandan interior minister who had just been sacked when I went to interview him in, uh, I think it was 95. Um, and he would later be assassinated in, in Nairobi by the RPF. Um, and um, it was fairly obvious he was a Hutu. He had been complaining about um, about um, RPF killings of Hutu uh, of Hutu civilians. He'd been sacked. It was fairly obvious that that things were already shifting, and that the RPF, which was a Tutsi-dominated movement, was beginning to show its ethnic teeth. But he wouldn't say anything. He wouldn't tell me why he'd been sacked. He was very loyal. He stuck by his own government. I remember talking to a an American diplomat friend who told me, listen, any government has the right to reshuffle. Um, the fact that he's a Hutu has nothing to do with it. Give these guys a chance. You know, uh, if they find that certain ministers aren't doing their job, they have to be allowed to sack them. And I was completely won over. And I, you know, I, and and then later when he was assassinated in in Nairobi, even then I was sort of very reluctant to believe that that was the RPF. I mean, where is it? It was a second attempt, so who else could it have been? And that was because I had very much, um, you know, accepted um, and swallowed the line that the RPF was a force for good, that um, it was a very progressive um, political movement that was bent on ethnic reconciliation, that murders, assassinations and reprisal killings were something that um, that the Hutu extremists went in for and not the this um, uh, movement that, that had come in and ended the genocide as the, as as was the sort of the story of the day and uh, i just didn't really want to believe it and i think you know i i talk in the book about this um disinclination we all have to adjust our vision of events and to look back and realize that we got things wrong it's something everyone finds very painful not just journalists it's something like you know nobody really wants to have to re question their opinions um and their beliefs um and yet we have to make ourselves do it occasionally and if you can you have to as a journalist make that possible as much as you can by asking people who don't agree with you i mean i think that's the lesson you have to sort of talk to people who don't agree with you so for example now with my book i mean i'm obviously a, a figure of hate on the side uh, of those uh, in government in Rwanda, and they've got plenty of, of sort of loyalists who are sort of barking, uh, barking at me on Twitter. But if somebody writes an email to me and says, you know, I, I've seen five mistakes in your book, I will always write back and say, tell me what they are. Uh, uh, tell me what they are so I can address them. And and sometimes the the conversation ends there because they haven't seen five mistakes in my book. They're just trying to rattle me. But I think, you know, I feel that's my duty as a journalist. I, I want to know. Tell me what I got wrong. Uh, and then if if I agree with you and I've checked it, I will correct it. Yeah, but that's the mark of a good journalist. And it's the mark of, as you've pointed out, it's not just in journalism. Postmortems are terribly important. You can't learn otherwise if you don't reassemble. Here's what I knew when I knew it. Here's why I made that decision. Oh, my God, I was completely wrong. Because otherwise you just keep on doing the same thing. Let me end with a question, though, and take advantage of your long history in Africa, your deep thinking about Africa. What do you think will be the big stories of the next, I don't know, five, ten years? What are the issues that are going to drive Africa over the next you know, five years, ten years? What are you going to be writing about ten years from now? That's, yeah, that's a massive question. You should have warned me you were going to ask me that. Um, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, as I've um, mentioned a couple of times now, Ethiopia, I think the Ethiopian story is going to be massive. And uh, I find that what's going on there very frightening. I'm not convinced that Ethiopia is going to stick together as a nation state um, in five years' time. So that would be a one to watch because if Ethiopia begins to fall apart and there are various wars of secession, um, that, that's going to have such a massive impact on the economy of the whole of uh, the Horn of Africa and Eastern Africa. So I would look th to that one. Nigeria, obviously, is the other country to watch. It always is. I don't know Nigeria well enough to, to focus on, but it's such a sort of big, vibrant, important, economically uh, dominant country that, that anything that happens there will matter to the rest 
to the rest of Africa. Um, what, I, what else can I say? I think um, urbanization is the theme that's going to be really interesting. Um, you know, you've had um, decades now in which um, uh, people have been rushing into the cities from rural areas where, you know, a lot of these rural areas have become overpopulated and, um, and de- the farms won't support the, the family. And in, in cities, interesting things happen. And in fact, you know, I was talking earlier about ethnic identity being the big challenge for Africa. Ethnic identities get mixed up into a lovely cocktail in, in cities. Even in the most deprived slums, people learn to tolerate one another. Uh, and they understand that people who have completely different backgrounds and speak different languages are still human beings and they end up dating each other, marrying each other, having kids together, going to the same schools. So um, I think that that that's going to be the sort of massive trend. It'll be impossible to quantify because it's going to be very slow, but that, that trend will change uh, countries forever. But, um, but the, the, the other major theme, of course, is going to be population growth, which you touched on at the, at the very beginning. Um, you know, uh, populations tend to be slowing all around the world, but not in Africa. Um, and so the issue then becomes, you know, uh, how do you support, you know, where's, where are the jobs going to come from? Um, you can't rely on land anymore. You know, you're going to have to have uh, manufacturing jobs or, or service sector jobs. Um, so that, that's going to be the really big challenge. And at the end of the day, and, and this is a question I, I hesitate to ask because it's completely unfair. Do you think that challenge will be met in a positive way in the main in, in, in Africa? Um, I, I'll dodge that one by saying I don't think you can generalize. Um, uh, you know, uh, if you look across Africa today, uh, the things that uh, apply to Southern Africa have absolutely no relevance to the Horn of Africa or Western Africa. I mean, it's such a diverse continent that there will be success stories um, in there and there'll be wars um, and, and you know, civil strife and military coups, just as there have always been. Uh, and then there'll be, you know, other stories where people think, oh, that place is absolutely amazing. Who would have thought it? Um, so I think it's, it'll just be a, a very um, kaleidoscopic picture. That's that's what I would expect. Well, thank you for that, because if you think there will be at least some success stories, if you think there will be that it's not all doom and gloom and, and dystopian, oh, my God, kind of outlook, that's a good thing. Well, you know, you can't generalize about Europe. Um, uh, no one would. Um, I, I don't think anyone would generalize about Asia. So I think we should, we should, you know, avoid that trap with Africa as well. You, 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 you can't just sort of say this is what it's going to be because um, it's just too diverse as a as a continent. One last thought. Um, I've spent a fair amount of time in the last year or two in Kenya. And the thing that most amazes me every time I talk to the Kenyans is how fundamentally optimistic and problem solving they all are. I will describe something that I am sure is hopeless. And somehow there's a strand in that that I didn't get and they'll pull on and produce um, a different way of looking at the same set of facts. And and I find that fundamentally uh, hopeful uh, because otherwise you end up, you do end up in dystopia. And that yes, I, I would agree. I have exactly the same uh, reaction when I read the Facebook posts of, of um, I have many Kenyan friends on my Facebook feed um, and, uh, and um, Nigeria is exactly the same. You get this incredible shot in the arm uh, whenever you read what people are saying there. It's, it's very cheering um, and, uh, and very important to hear those voices. Well, thank you very much. I can't wait for the next book. So promise it's coming soon. Thank you for having me, and uh, I'll do my best. (laughs) Thank you for joining us. Please rate our show on Apple Podcasts and subscribe. Meanwhile, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergfoundation.org to learn more about our work. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org. Thank you, and we'll be back again next week for another episode of Talberg's New Thinking for a New World. This podcast was brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. <laughs>